Hey, it's Tim back for Wrong Sports, and this is gonna be episode two of my new series called Deep Dives, where I go into the craziest, or maybe the longest, or maybe the best streaks in college football. In my first video, I went over the longest losing streak in Division II, which lasted four plus years. That was from Lock Haven University. You can check that out over here in the side or up above. And as you can tell from some of my other videos, you see that I like to go over worst college football teams because I did worst college football teams from pretty much every decade. I did do some positive videos to start the year, but I'm back into some more bad teams. And this next episode is going to be all about the longest losing streak in Division I football. That is from Columbia and the Columbia Lions episode. 47 game long losing streak but before I get into this deep dive for Columbia make sure you like this video make sure you share this video and also make sure you subscribe to the channel please leave me a comment on any video just tell me what you like about the video what you don't like about the video and what you think I should be covering next either in a deep dive or in any other video and then also make sure you check me out on Twitter at sports wronged but let's start this deep dive of the Columbia Lions of the 1980s so if you don't know, Columbia is located in the heart of New York City, and they were the third team to play college football in 1870, losing their match to Rutgers 6-3. After that, they never really got to national prominence, but they would have the occasional really good season, example being 1915 where they were 5-0, or 1926 where they were 6-3, but they were never really good until Lou Little became their coach in 1930. Little turned this team into a regional power quick, and then into a national power as they went 8-1 in 1933 and went to the Rose Bowl and won it. Little then coached them until 1957, but by 1950, this school fell into the bottom, and when the the Ivy League formed in the late 1950s, Columbia was routinely finishing towards the bottom, with their only first place finish coming in 1961. So after hearing that little history lesson, it wasn't a shock that when the 1980s started, Columbia was struggling and they brought in a new coach in Robert Nazo. He was a Rutgers alumni and an assistant for Rutgers when they were a top team in the East in the 1970s. He was also a defensive guy and it showed in 1980 and 81, where the team scored less than 10 points per game, but their defense wasn't really getting torched as they only gave up 26 points per game and ended both seasons at 1-9 and nine finishes. After the 1981 season though, the Ivy League was reclassified to the FCS, but that didn't really matter to Columbia as they continued being 1-9 in 1982 and another one-win season in 1983, but they were 1-7-2, so it was a slightly better winning percentage. Even though their records didn't improve, they did on offense as they averaged over 20 points per game, but on defense they didn't and they went down a lot as they averaged giving up over 36 points per game in that 1983 season. Okay, so before I get into full seasons of this deep dive, I have to mention 1983 because it is very significant. You heard me mention their record of 1-7-2. and two. Well, the streak started here in 1983 because their final win happened on October 15th, 1983 when they beat Yale 21 to 18. After that, they proceeded to tie Bucknell the next week, then lose badly to Holy Cross, and then finally tie Dartmouth 17 to 17. They would lose their final two games of the 1983 season to Cornell and Brown, so that is where officially the losing streak starts. So when they get into the 1984 season, they are currently on a two game losing streak and a five game winless streak. Okay, so along with Coach Nazo coming back, they were coming into the 1984 season with a lot of new faces and a big one in their quarterback is John Wachowski who had 3,000 yards the previous two seasons he graduated and their new starter Henry Santos had some big shoes to fill along with that they had a carousel at running back which resulted in Columbia never having a 1,000 runner up to this time the receivers coming back of notice was their tight end, who was named to the first team Ivy League in 1983. His name was Dan Uppercoe. 
Meanwhile, on defense, there were no players of notice coming back. There was one player on the first or second team defense in 1983, but in 1984, they had none on either list, which kind of spoils how their defense is going to look this year. The season started with those different faces, and also this season ushered in a new stadium, as they left Baker Field in 1982, and for 1983, they played 10 neutral site games, which were mostly on the road, but they did have the occasional game at Giant Stadium. But with the 1984 season starting, they would open up a new stadium in Lawrence A. Ween Stadium for six home games. And they would start this season with a home game on September 22nd versus Harvard. Harvard were the co-champions of the Ivy League last year, and Harvard jumped out to an early 14-0 lead behind their running game, and even though Columbia would be at 17-14 just after halftime, Harvard prevailed after a fourth quarter field goal and interception return for a touchdown, making the final 35-21. Harvard had over 330 yards rushing, while Columbia did have 200 plus passing yards behind Santos' 160 yards. Another start for Columbia in this game was Uprico, as he had six catches for 120 yards. But with this loss to Harvard, they are 0-1 in the season, and their losing streak is at three, with their winless streak being at six. Next week saw Columbia face Lafayette, who were 1-2 coming in and not in the Ivy League, which was one of the two out-of-conference games they played every year. I don't have stats on this game, but the final was 23-14, and Lafayette would end up 5-5 five five this season. With the loss to Lafayette, it also continues another losing streak to non-conference opponents, as that stood at 11, with their last non-conference win coming back in 1980 versus Lafayette. And Game 3 was the first away game as they played undefeated Penn. Penn didn't take Columbia lightly, and it took them up until the second quarter to break this game open with three touchdowns, and it would be 28-0 Penn at half. And a few minutes after half, it would be 35-0. This game was utter dominance by Penn, as they had 200 yards on offense in the first half, and guess what, they had 400-plus total yards at the end of this game. Also, Penn's defense was great as Columbia didn't have a positive rushing yard until after the second half and didn't get into Penn territory until the third quarter, which was probably against second teamers by that point. Columbia did manage to score with less than a minute left, but again, that was probably against the second and third teamers of Penn. The final was 35-7 and Columbia was 0-3. Week 4 was back at home versus Princeton, who were looking for something positive after a crushing loss the previous week to Brown, and yeah, they started really well, as Princeton's quarterback started the game 8 for 8, and then he torched Columbia, being up 31 to nothing at half. Princeton had over 400 total yards, with 250 rushing yards. Columbia didn't do anything of note, scoring really late in the game, so they didn't get shut out, so let's just move on. Because I want to go over week 5, which was very interesting as they played Yale. Yale was coming into the game 2-2 two and two and looking for their first winning record since 1980, and they were still coached by the famous Karm Koza. The game had its drama as Yale was up 21-7, but Columbia came back after a 93-yard touchdown run with 8 minutes left to tie it up at 21. Yale took the lead back with their own 90-yard drive, and Columbia had one more chance to score. Santos led them into the red zone with 6 seconds left and threw a pass to the end zone which was knocked away and they couldn't get the touchdown to tie. So Columbia lost and their record is 0-5 and the streak sits at 7. They played out of conference Colgate next who had NFL talent at quarterback, his name was Steve Calabria, and Colgate was coming in 4-2 but started slow as Columbia had the lead twice in the first half but Colgate would score before the half and take a 14-10 lead and kept it until the end. Colgate did most of their damage through the air as Calabria had over 300 yards passing and he also ran for a touchdown. Columbia didn't do much on offense, but I do want to mention one player in Jimmy Henderson who had a 90-yard touchdown run in the previous game. He would have a 90-yard kickoff return in this game. The final was 35-16 and the streak is at 8. And we go back to Ivy League games for the rest of the year, and I'll just gloss over this next loss because it was really nasty as Columbia traveled to New Hampshire to play Dartmouth. Dartmouth were 0-6 coming into this game, but they had an okay offense that looked amazing versus Columbia in this game as they had over 400 yards and Dartmouth won 41-9. Well, that last loss was embarrassing, but Columbia was back at home to play Cornell in Game 8. 
Coach Nazo may be sensing that he was done here, bench Santos, his best quarterback, and started a new quarterback with the last name Von Schnoderbeck. Von Schnoderbeck didn't do very well and he was benched in the second half, which allowed Santos to come back on the field. He got Columbia within two, but Cornell would get 10 straight points and grab the 19-7 win. The loss looked worse when the season was over, as Columbia scored more points over the season than Cornell, but couldn't outscore them here in this game. The final game couldn't come here enough as Columbia played Brown, who were 3-5. Brown, like Columbia, weren't a top-tier team in the Ivy, but they were always a pretty tough middle-of-the-road team. I don't have stats on this game, but it was a 28-14 final. So with this game, they would lose 11 in a row and were winless in their last 14. For Columbia on offense this season, they scored 117 points, or 13 points per game. Their leading rusher was Jimmy Henderson, as he had 444 yards, and he got 90 of that on that one run there. The passing leader was Henry Santos, as he only had 1,074 yards, which was a 2,000-yard decrease from the previous season. Their leading receiver, though, was probably their best player on offense, as Uppercoe had nearly half the passes from Santos for 489 yards. And on defense, they were pretty bad, as they gave up 273 points, or 30.3 points per game. They gave up 35-plus points in five games, and it could have been much worse because I mentioned a lot of teams would put in their second and even third stringers to allow Columbia to score to not get shut out. Anyway, Coach Bob Nazo would be gone after this year, but if you thought this season was bad, 1985 would get even worse and a little bit wacky, too. Once again on the battlefield of that great tradition where we find a student from Columbia University and then we're going to ask him a very simple question. Here it is. Why does Columbia always lose? I don't know. I'm a freshman and that course isn't offered till junior year. Okay, so we are through the first full year of this streak, and we're now getting into 1985, and this year started with the announcement of a new coach in James Garrett. Garrett was a good player that had a lot of bad luck as he had two NFL contracts end by injury, with the last one being exceptionally brutal as he was signed to the New York Giants team but broke his leg in six places during the spring drills and he never played again. Garrett would successfully become a coach at the young age of 30 in 1960 when he coached at Susquehanna. He had great success here as through his first five years he was 39-4-1, but in his sixth season they started 0-7 and in the middle of a game, Garrett struck a player who was wearing a helmet but still, and Garrett resigned right after the game due to a family member of the player threatening legal action against him. So after that, Garrett was out of football for two years before becoming an assistant for a semi-pro league, but did eventually get NFL jobs in the 1970s. He became a VP and coach for the Houston Texans of the New World Football League. After the World Football League, he jumped around some more, becoming a New Jersey high school football coach for less than a year, and that will come in handy later on. I'll be mentioning that again, so don't worry. Then he jumped back to the NFL, mostly with the Cleveland Browns as an offensive back coach, and then becoming a director of research and development development from 1982 to 1984. In Cleveland, he was a really good scout, and even though his early college coaching career ended badly, he would be hired by Columbia. Another reason might be that James Garrett had some really talented sons, all between the ages of 15 and 18, and one was about to go to college in his oldest son, Judd Garrett. So I'm not saying that this is the reason for the school hiring him, but some articles I've read on him referenced alumni and fans wanting to have the Garrett sons on the side lines, as it would definitely improve this team. Anyway though, Jim Garrett got on campus and too bad he couldn't play freshman as the Ivy League didn't allow that at the time, so his son Judd, who played on the freshman team in 1985, and his other son John had an injury and would sit out the 1985 season, so Coach Garrett was without all of his sons. But besides the players of note who are not on the field, let's get some players of note who are coming back, and for the running back they had their carousel of running backs, but John Chirico was back as he had over 300 yards the previous season and a few touchdowns, so at least that was something positive. Also, their first team Ivy League tight end, Uppercoe, graduated, but quarterback Henry Santos was back for his senior year, so that was at least another positive on this dreadful offense. On defense, though, there weren't any defensive guys of note, as none showed up on the Ivy League first team, and one guy, a linebacker, showed up on the second team, so again, this was going to be a spoiler of what was to come on their defense. But let's start the season 
season already since there will be more wackiness coming with this season. The season started September 21st versus Harvard in Boston, and what a game it was as Columbia took it to Harvard early, scoring twice in the first quarter on a Santos touchdown pass and then a Chirico touchdown run. And their defense responded early with, with two turnovers and only giving up 54 yards, giving Columbia a 14 to nothing lead at half. Columbia put another field goal on late in the third quarter, but after that drive, Harvard turned the lights on and connected on a 50-yard touchdown pass, leading to a quick touchdown. So it was only 17 to seven. Then Harvard's defense held Columbia to three straight three and outs, leading to bad punts, which I'll be talking about in a second, and giving Harvard great field position so that Harvard could take advantage and then they would score on the next three possessions to make it 21 to 17 by the end of the third quarter. And then they would score on their next four to eventually win this game 49 to 17. By the final score, it seemed like it was easy for Harvard, but it really wasn't because as you can see, all of their points were scored after the third quarter started. But this was a positive for Columbia and Garrett since they actually had a lead in the second half, which was rare, and they did look really good in the first half of this game. The second half though, they didn't look all that good. But going back to that punting comment I mentioned, Coach Garrett would come out after the game to comment about his punter, Peter Murphy, but it was a nice as he said Murphy would never kick for the team again, and the coach also questioned the player's ability to hold the job if his professional work matched his performance on the football field, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I get it, Murphy did have a few bad punts that I can't find exact yardage for, but Harvard did have 98 return yards, and Harvard's second touchdown was an 8-yard drive, so my assumption is that that drive started on a very bad punt. After the comments, though, Garrett was forced to apologize by the school on Tuesday, but due Due to those comments, Peter Murphy came out two days later to the school's media department to say he had no anger towards the coach or the school, but he was quitting the team. If you're wondering why the punter quit, it might be due to the coach's piss poor apology where he said, I think it was my failure as a football coach to bring out his best that was festering. And it might not have been totally his inability to kick that day as much as it was that I was looking for him to do something in a big way that would have helped us. We might have assumed automatically, which is a very very dangerous thing to do, that he was going to be a good punter. Maybe I wasn't paying attention to my business about where he was. Wow. Well, that was only week one, and they were already 0-1, and they weren't looking good, as they would get to week two, and this one wasn't thrilling, as they were shut out 20 to nothing to out-of-conference opponent Lafayette, and their new punter John Williamson, who averaged 34.4 yards on nine punts, which really wasn't any better than Peter Murphy's six punts the previous week for an average of 35 yards, but there wasn't any uh, punter comments after this game. Week three was their game at home versus Penn, and it was an absolute beatdown. Penn had a 37 to nothing lead at half and were up 43 to nothing before Columbia led by Santos through two touchdowns in the fourth quarter so the final was 46 to 14 the touchdown passes were quite significant since up to that point Penn didn't give up a touchdown pass in 30 quarters the touchdown passes didn't hurt them but it's a nice stat for Columbia also if you're wondering they averaged 35 yards on punts Columbia is now 0 and 3 and they have 14 straight losses week 4 they would play Princeton and Princeton was looking to get to 500 and was really easy for them with a 31 to nothing win. Nothing of value here for offense for Columbia as they had 112 yards of total offense and five first downs. Not sure the punting yards average though, so sorry about that. Columbia under Garrett is now 0 and 4. Week 5 was homecoming versus Yale, and the game had a lot of penalties in 18, resulting in over 170 penalty yards. Other than that, only two turnovers in this game where Columbia had a brief lead and were in this game until halftime. But that brief lead was only 3-0, and that stayed until the second quarter when Yale scored after initially making a field goal. But due to Columbia having too many men on the field, Yale was given the ball inside the 10, and they scored a touchdown, giving them the 7-3 lead. But Yale opened the game up with their second touchdown. There were five minutes left and Yale was in the red zone, but their pass was intercepted. Lucky for Yale though, not for Columbia, because the ball was eventually returned to Yale on a penalty and Yale would score to take the 14-6 lead. Columbia would add their only other touchdown of the day on a Santos touchdown pass, but the two-point conversion failed, so it was 14-12 at half. After half, Columbia did nothing to get them any points, and Yale slowly put more points on the board 
Ford to win this game 28-12. And Santos was the clear star for Colombia in this game as he had 281 passing yards, but it wasn't enough to get them any more points, and with Yale averaging over 400 yards of total offense, they really couldn't win this game. Also, if you want to know, Columbia had six punts for an average of 29 yards, so they're getting a little worse even after Murphy quit the team. So Columbia staying home versus Bucknell, who are a non-conference opponent and on a three-game losing streak during which they scored a touchdown or less. Columbia had the advantage in this game, but due to not having any stats, all that I know is Columbia had a slim lead, but Bucknell ended up winning this game 13-10. Bucknell would go on to lose their last three games and get shut out in two of them, so this was a nice end of the season gift for Bucknell. But not for Columbia. As the losing continued, more people on campus started to take notice of their fiery rookie coach. So I mention that because besides the punter incident, Coach Garrett didn't hit any players. That's coming later. But what I did find were some out there comments by Garrett. His first comment came before the season when he called his players drug addicted losers. And obviously the cure for them was winning a game. He then talked about during his three-year contract they would win 10 games and schedule great teams like Pittsburgh and Auburn. Most took it as a coach that had lofty goals for a terrible team, which isn't bad, but it wasn't going to happen overnight. However, after another 0-6 start, talk like this shouldn't be said, and it would get even worse as the season continued. They would follow up the close loss with a horrifying loss to Colgate. Colgate were 5-2 and, and looking for more wins as they were independent, so maybe they could go to the FCS playoff this year. Colgate had over 300 yards through the air, and that was even getting picked off three times by Columbia. Columbia didn't do much even with those turnovers, and didn't score until they were so far out of it, so this loss was pretty easy for them. They lost 55-11. to The last three games were all Ivy League teams for Columbia. First up was Dartmouth, and this would be Columbia's final game in Wii Stadium, a stadium that they have never won in since it opened. Dartmouth started the season like Columbia, 0-5, but their last two games Games, they won one and tied one, and Dartmouth wouldn't have to waste too much time to score their second win, as they had a 20 to nothing lead in the second quarter before Columbia scored a pitiful field goal to be down 20 to three at half. Dartmouth did the rest to eventually win 34 to three, and Columbia are now winless in their last 19 and 0 and 11 in their new stadium, and they play on the road for their last two games. First, they travel to Ithaca, New York, to play Cornell, who are two and six and winners of their last two so playing very well, you can see. The game was being played under foul conditions with rain, just above freezing temperatures, and lots of turnovers. The turnovers were mostly for Columbia, as they had three fumbles, and Cornell did have a pick, but the worst part of the game was Columbia's punting game, as Williamson had a punt blocked for a safety for Cornell's first points. Also, he had a fumbled snap, giving Cornell the ball at the Columbia 39. Columbia had the first points, but the turnovers and those bad punts made 15-3 Cornell by the fourth quarter, and the game was eventually over 21-8. So Columbia are now 0-9, and they have one more chance to get that win of the season as they would play their last game on the road versus Brown, who were 4-4-1. Four, four, and one. And it wasn't difficult for Brown, and Columbia didn't really do anything on offense. I don't have any stats on this game, but I do have the final. It was 34 to nothing, so you can assume that Columbia did absolutely nothing on offense. So Columbia was 0-10, and, and the streak is now at 21 straight losses. On offense, they scored 75 points, or 7.5 points a game, which was the lowest of the streak. Along with that, their leading rusher was John Chirico. He had 518 yards, and their leading passer, Henry Santos, did have over 1,600 passing yards, both of which were increases over the previous season. Unfortunately, it was the turnovers that hurt them, scoring less points, and of course, their kicking game, because why not blame them some more? On defense, they gave up 331 points, or 33 points per game. They gave up 34 plus points in half of the games, and you could hear as I went through the season that they were out of a lot of these games early and had no shot of winning. Okay, and just when you think the season is over, it's not done yet, because after that debacle to end the season, the New York Times went to interview first-year head coach Jim Garrett, and, and he was very confident confident in his team for his second season. When the paper asked if he would be back next year, he said, 
the school has never given another coach less than a year, and he thought he would get three years, as he assumed in 1987 when his freshmen became juniors, the winning would eventually start, and also he would have at least one of his sons on the team at this time. Apparently, some at the university saw this and weren't happy, as they would come out the next day after the interview to say that Garrett has put in his resignation and the school had accepted it. Well, that was a shock to some players, and also angered some too, and also relieved some. But after the first game versus Harvard and the punter comments, Garrett was more subdued and got used to the Ivy League way of doing things. But when looking more into Garrett's past, you can see that his comments and actions weren't the only time he got fired or left a job. I told you about how he lost his first college head coaching job, but I glossed over Garrett's time as a high school coach in New Jersey because that lasted less than a year, and it wasn't because he got another NFL NFL job quick. No, it was because he hit a high school player on the head during a game, and this sent players and local educators to oust Garrett quickly before the season was over. So not sure if that high school story was a big reason for him leaving, but Columbia might have gotten a look at it and they were looking for reasons to get rid of him. Some players on the team talked about picketing the athletic office for Garrett's return, but they ended up not doing it and Garrett was officially gone. Garrett's son Judd, a star on the freshman team, found out when the rest of the team found out at a players meeting when an assistant told him of the news. After that, Judd got up from the meeting and just left and didn't return. After the resignation, the Columbia athletic director, Al Paul, was asked if Coach Garrett could have done anything to save his job, and the athletic director bluntly replied, no. Garrett left, as would all of his sons, and they would all go to Princeton, eventually becoming stars on the Princeton football team in 1987 and 88, and then the star quarterback Jason Garrett would be the MVP of the Ivy League in 1988, but you'll be hearing a little bit about them later on. Oof, that season was long, and that is why this is going to be a two-parter. This is the end of part one of the deep dive of the Columbia Lions epic losing streak in the mid-1980s. As always, make sure you like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel, please, because I will be putting part two out next week. And if you subscribe to it, you'll be able to check it out first. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Sports Wronged. And stay tuned for part two of this epic deep dive of the Columbia Lions losing streak of the mid-1980s. Thank you so much.